thing. Well, Fatbe is going to take the questions from the uh, chat box. I'm just quickly checking the waiting room, but no, Rami Bey is not here. Um, I, I just talked to him, sorry. Uh, he said he's logging in right now, but for the technical reasons, uh, he would ask you to uh, share his presentation from your computer, please. Okay, I think um, we can do that, yeah. Or if you want, I can do that too, no problem. I can, I can do that, or back, okay. I can do that, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then but if Fatbe is gonna take the questions from the chat box and then uh, after we answer the questions, I'm going to take the floor again, and then we, we're going to wrap up the uh, meeting. And I hope we don't have any problems or setbacks, and we have a great, great meeting. It's two now. Should we start letting people in? I believe, yes, it's not good to keep them. I think it's already two. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, third GTFM meeting. Um, we're going to start the meeting in a couple of minutes. I'm sharing my screen now. So we have 40 participants now. Um, some something around uh, Okay, let me just wait for another minute and then we can go ahead with the, with the meeting. So I believe we are for the for the four. Maybe we can we can for the five. Yeah, um, we can slowly start with the uh, with the session. So yeah, welcome everyone um, and hello, dear global task force on migration network. Uh, welcome to the third uh, meeting of our DGFM. Um, we're glad to glad to be continuing with our online gatherings, and today marks the third meeting of the GTFM year. Um, um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm Aishenur Aydoğan from GTFM Secretariat at UCL Jimawa, and I'll be moderating the meeting today. Uh, so we can start the, uh, um, we can quickly start with our meeting. So here, sorry. Uh, here's a quick overview of the meeting agenda for today. Um, um, so, 
Um, this is GTFM Secretariat. Uh, this is uh, my part for the first 10 minutes. And then we're gonna start with the keynote speech from Eloise uh, Rodel from International Labor Organization. And then after her uh, keynote speech, we're gonna go ahead start and start with our first, first session um, on the subject, access to decent work, uh, reducing the risk of migrant workers exploitation and promoting access to grievance mechanisms. The first session is gonna be moderated um, by Walt and Barish Bay, Barish Timur, um, uh, reporting specialist. Um, he's gonna moderate the first session. We're gonna have Fulia Memishola from Yildiz Technical University and uh, um, Goshtas, uh, Mr. Goshtas Mozafariya from Asian Mayors Forum. And then we're gonna have um, Susan Klink from UNHCR. And as for the second session uh, on the subject, local partnerships with the private sector, maximizing the contribution of migrants to the local economies. Um, Fuat Bay from Gaziantep uh, Metropolitan Municipality is going to moderate this session. He's, um, he's for, uh, from the Department of Foreign uh, and International uh, Relationships Department. We're gonna have Rami Sharak from Syrian Economic Forum. And, um, Aza Al Hayak from Skill Lab, uh, private uh, entrepreneurship uh, from Europe, from Netherlands, and now we're gonna wrap up the um, meeting. Uh, let me give you uh, an introduction for those of you who are not familiar with the Global Task Force on Migration. The forum hosted 400, uh, and it, uh, 400 uh, participants and it was opened by the Vice President, uh, the, Glo uh, the Gaziantep Municipal Forum. It hosted 400 participants and it was opened by the Vice President of the Republic of Turkey and 60 mayors and international representatives from five continents um, it shared experiences and be best practices with the participants. The forum was co-hosted by the Gaziantep Metropolitan Municipality, UNDP, and the United uh, Union of Municipalities of Turkey, United Cities and Local Government Middle East and West Asia section, the World Academy for Local Democracy, WALT, UNHCR, and IOM. The key outcome of the forum was the 2019 Gaziantep Declaration, outlining key principles of implementation of global commitments on local solutions to migration and displacement. Uh, 38 stakeholders signed a declaration during this event, including mayors, representatives from local development actors, civil society, and UN agencies. In order to follow up with the declaration, uh, we established the Global Task Force on Migration as a network under the UCL Jimova Social Inclusion Committee. The purpose of the Global Task Force is to guide its members with the objective to enable cities to learn from each other. Um, I'm actually really sorry that I just rem remembered. Um, we're, we're planning of having the recording of this meeting. I hope it's okay with everyone. We're just gonna take the recording of the session. Our host is gonna record the session. Yeah. Um, continuing, improving the evidence based on, based on needs, gaps and opportunities regarding the arrival and presence of refugees and migrants in urban spaces that would allow local, national and global decision makers to better target and address the major challenges ahead in this field and to support the adoption of relevant strategies and actions. Um, the Global Task Force was created through an open call for membership during the uh, 2019 Municipal Forum. The call remained open for additional memberships after the forum. Technical affairs of the global, global task force, including but not limited to implementation of the work, work plan and admission of new members will be managed by a steering committee, which consists of the partners of the International Forum on Local Solutions to Migration and Displacement. The global task force is a part of uh, the global ecos ecosystem of migration and its work will feed into uh, the policies and practices of the mayor's mechanism consisting of UCLG, IOM, and My Mayor's Migration Council, as well as other city-related work streams taken forward jointly with UN agencies. With the support of our colleagues from UCLG and Mayor Mayor's Migration Council, we were able to engage with the international dialogue through our participation in the GFMD process. Um, here I'm gonna, uh, 
here, here I want to show you our, um, again, our roadmap. Um, uh, here you can see in the first meeting, we launched the GTFM and introduced it uh, to our network. Um, we presented its purpose, objective, and roadmap. Um, after the first meeting, we made a survey and distributed it with, it, uh, with the network of GTFM to explore the area we need to focus on for this year and to engage our members with uh, engage our members with the whole outcome of the GTFM. We choose the subjects of today's meeting and the second meeting that we had before according to the results uh, we had from this survey. The second meeting of the GTFM was on the subject, the importance of multi-level governance to ensure effective local responses to migration and displacement. And it was a fruitful discussion. The meeting hosted a variety of local authorities from around the world and international organization representatives. At the end of this process of these GTFM meetings, we're planning to have a face-to-face -face meeting if, uh, if we have the we have the right conditions, um, namely COVID-19. In this meeting and in this face-to-face um, -face meeting, uh, which we're planning on having, the original plan was to have it on um, June. But um, since we're having this third meeting in May, may we're, we're thinking of maybe uh, having it on July. Um, we so. And in that face-to-face -face meeting, uh, we can uh, discuss the final report of the GTFM and prepare another roadmap maybe for the next year. So for our keynote speaker, I'd like to, I, I'd like to introduce Ms. Um, Eloise Rodal, a senior technic technical specialist on crisis migration, International Labor Organization. Uh, Eloise Rodin joined the Labor Mig Migration Branch of the International Labor Organiz Organization, ILO, as Senior te uh, Technical Specialist in Crisis Migration in 2019. Uh, she has uh, 20 years of experience on humanitarian assistance and protection activities, including in fragile and post-conflict contexts. She has expertise in refugees, forced displacement, humanitarian and development policies. She served as a policy analyst, evaluator, researcher, researcher and project manager for a wide range of international organizations, uh, government ministries, non-governmental organizations and academic institutions, including the OECD, the World Bank, OCHA, the Finnish, Danish and Swiss ministries of foreign affairs, the START network, the Norwegian Refugee Council, Geneva Call, and the Refugee Studies Center at the University of Oxford. In 2016, she has done substantive research on refugees' access to the labor market for the World Bank and uh, ILO with Emeritus Professor Roger Zetter of the Refugee Studies Center University of, at the University of Oxford. And in 2017, she undertook a meta-analysis for the OECD of the current response to refugee crisis in developing countries. She has also worked both for and with UNHCR in the field as well as at the headquarters. She holds a Master of Economic and Social Studies in International Politics from um, Ebert, Ebertswit University in Wales and a Master's in Public Law from the Faculty of Law and Political Sciences of Rennes in France. Uh, uh, before I'd like to um, welcome Ms. Uh, Eloise, uh, we're not going to have a Q&A session in the uh, after her after the keynote speech, but we're going to have the Q&A sessions after each session namely the first session and the second session. Maybe you can, if you, if you have anything uh, in mind, uh, ask questions, um, you can keep the, you can ask them in the, at the uh, ends of the sessions. So Ms. Uh, Eloise, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. So I'm very pleased um, to take part on behalf of the International Labor Organization in the Global Task Force on Migration webinar on migrants and refugees' access to labor markets towards equality for displaced workers. This initiative, which has its origin in the municipal forum held in 2019, aimed at putting into practice the Global Compact on Refugees and the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, and highlights that integrating migrants and refugees into the labor markets in a dignified way is both necessary and possible and something that is particularly 
important in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis. But first, I want to take you back in time to remind you that from its inception over 100 years ago, the ILO, the UN Agency for the World of Work, has been engaged in the employment and labor aspects of refugees and migrants. Since 1919, in the aftermath of World War I, the organization was actively involved in helping refugees find jobs and protecting them from exploitation. Of course, ILO's response has continuously adapted and met the challenges of labor migration and the ever increasing scale, duration and complexity of global displacements. ILO's role has been key in facilitating the need to mitigate the socioeconomic impact of large scale displacement on host communities and transitioning to sustainable livelihood for refugees and hosts. The ILO has been promoting fair and effecting, effective labor migration governance in line with international human rights and labor standards. I want to highlight that in 2016, the ILO has adopted the guiding principles on the access of refugees and other forcibly displaced persons to the labor markets. This document is available in the three ILO languages as well as in Turkish and Arabic. I just want to highlight that. And this, together with ILO Recommendation 205 on Employment and Decent Work for Peace and Resilience, adopted in 2017, it provides normative guidance for the world of work contributions to refugees' integrations. These instruments, together with the Global Compact for Refugees, have established a global momentum for addressing issues of refugees' access to labor markets through a rights-based approach. We know that migrants and displaced populations are more easily marginalized and excluded, are often susceptible to decent work deficits and discriminatory treatment. Developing countries may struggle to absorb large number of displaced persons facing their own labor market challenges, including high unemployment and informality. This often leads to competition amongst refugees, migrants and nationals for poor quality jobs. Core to ILO's mandates are the principles of social justice, equality of workers and non-discrimination. The ILO promotes decent work approach, by which we mean the provision of work and income opportunities for all, but also the protection, promotion of workplace rights, equality and social dialogue. According to the ILO, decent work sums up the aspirations of people in their working lives for opportunity and income, rights, voice and recognition. For the ILO, decent work strengthens resilience enabling the fulfillment of social and economic rights, opening the door for durable solution and social justice. The opportunity to access decent work is fundamental to the protection and well-being of migrants and refugees and to preserve or restore their sense of dignity and life purpose. The COVID-19 pandemic caused new challenges and enhanced old ones. It has put a significant challenges on public health as well as livelihood and exacerbated the vulnerability of migrant workers and displaced population to crisis whilst reducing their access to coping strategies. These workers, often in low wage jobs in the informal sectors have been particularly hard hit and have experienced discriminatory treatment. As a result, many have faced worsening working conditions and weakened protection. At the same time, the COVID crisis has also led to an increase in demand for some workers, for instance, in the medical sectors, but also in agriculture, in food and home delivery, logistic, cleaning services. And refugees and migrants have been at the forefront of many of these occupations. So this year, International Workers' Day on, on May the 1st was therefore the occasion of a renewed call, not only from the ILO, but the entire UN network on migration to put our attention and support those in the most vulnerable situation at the center of our immediate protection effort. The pandemic has also highlighted the importance of adopting inclusive and sustainable approach that promotes social cohesion between communities. 
By focusing on decent work, the ILO makes a substantial contribution to move from short-term humanitarian assistance to sustainable livelihood that promote refugees and migrants' resilience and self-reliance, which is ultimately enhancing peaceful coexistence between migrants, refugees, and host communities. We also know that women and men are affected differently in situations of displacement and that women are particularly exposed in time of crisis. And we've seen that with COVID, the COVID pandemic. But out of crisis can emerge opportunities for women to take up new roles, utilize their training and skills and challenge traditional power dynamic, which we can only encourage. So while the global picture is, is grim with uh, the displacements of Syrians, Venezuelans, Afghans, Rohingyas, and others being protracted, the ILO is encouraged by the increasing number of governments, local actors, and partners who recognize the positive contribution that migrants and refugees can make to host societies. They are producers consumers and entrepreneurs who make autonomous decisions about their livelihood, the applications of their skills and qualifications and their socioeconomic well-being. This is aligned to the aspiration of the Gaziantep Declaration that referred to the potential of refugees and migrants as factors of economic growth. Inclusive framework and program led by cities and municipalities can promote inclusion support migrants and refugees and bring communities together. Uh, these actors are able to assist with the immediate response in crisis situations, as well as having the capacity to create an enabling environment, facilitating access to labor markets, but also the social inclusions of migrants and refugees by fostering this peaceful coexistence, which I mentioned. And I'll just give you a, a few examples to be more concrete. For instance, in the aftermath of the Beirut explosion in Lebanon in August 2020, the ILO mobilized its employment intensive infrastructure program and working closely with the municipality of Beirut, it created over 100 short term decent work for Lebanese nationals and Syrians refugee clearing debris, debris and rubble. In Latin America, to change, to change continent, the ILO is leading in partnership with UNHCR and IOM on a new project building the capacity of local governments in Santiago, Chile, and Mexico City to strengthen the socioeconomic integrations of migrants and refugees through access to decent work, sustainable livelihood, and social dialogue. And this project is innovative in that it notably represents the first effort in Latin America to leverage cross-sector citywide capacities in an integrated framework to support migrants and refugee integration. And to get back to the origin of the Global Task Force on Migration, I would like to give you uh, an example from Gaziantep on how municipalities can support refugees to access decent work. Between 2018 and 2020, the ILO, under the leadership of UN Women and in cooperation with the Association for Solidarity with Asylum Seekers and Migrants, ASAM, supported skills and language training, as well as the establishment of a women led cooperative at the SADA Women Only Center in Gaziantep. And from the government side, the Gaziantep Metropolitan Municipality was the main counterpart and substantially contributed to the success of this project. Then I want to highlight that central to ILO's work in migration and displacement context is the importance that the ILO attaches to collaboration and partnerships. Core to ILO's work on refugees and core to my own personal uh, work is the institutional partnership with the UNHCR. And this is based on a, an MOU and a joint action plan that we have. And our relationship focuses on the complementarity of our respective mandates with a common objective to focus on the rights to work, to work as well as the rights at, at work. Then in September 2020, the ILO and the United Development Program, UNDP, agreed on a framework for action that builds on key area of collaboration and seeks to add concrete value 
to both organizations' strategic priorities within the context of the UN system-wide socioeconomic response to the COVID crisis, to chart pathways for a prompt, sustainable, and inclusive recovery once the pandemic is under control in a longer-term perspective. Uh, and last but not least, to, uh, I wanted to highlight that in October 2020, the ILO and the International um, and the International Organization for Migration (IOMs) also signed an agreement to create a framework for cooperation and collaboration to enhance the benefits of migration for all. This framework includes joint support for improved migration governance, capacity building, and policy coherence at national, regional, and global level. level. And in the, word, the words of, of ILO's uh, Director General, Guy Ryder, this collaboration will support reshaping the world of work so that it is more inclusive, equitable, and sustainable. But I would like to finish uh, by, by sharing a few lessons learned from ILO's experience in developing strategies to create decent work opportunities for migrants and refugees drawn from our work in countries across the world. First, we have found that comprehensive strategies which combine both supply and demand sides approaches to job matching and employment creations while taking into account the broader development context works best. Second, strategies that are inclusive in that they bring together host communities, migrants, refugees, are based on the principles of equality of treatment and opportunities for all workers, and they are conducive to social cohesion and sustainability. Third, strategies that are focused on enabling migrants and refugees to access quality jobs that maintain rights and improve working conditions for all workers, providing dignity and purpose are the ones that make a difference the most. And then make one recommendation. City and municipal actors have proved and been recognized as central actors on the front line in integrating migrants and refugees into labor markets and other aspects of society. We can recall the 2019 High Commissioner's Dialogue on the role of cities, municipal authorities in protecting and assisting refugees, IDPs, and stateless persons in urban settings, the Meyer Migration Forum, their inclusion in the Global Forum on Migration and Development, the recognition of the importance of local authorities in the Global Compact on Migration across, across a range of objectives. But now is the time to more systematically involve municipal authorities in strategy and policy making. Local authorities uh, will be critical in determining whether refugees and migrants are part of a sustainable post-COVID recovery. recovery. They can create enabling conditions for migrants and refugees to work, connecting workers to employers, and ensuring decent work. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. That was really valuable. Um, indeed, ILO is uh, one of the cornerstones of the international organizations when it comes to um, discussion on labor market for migration, migrants and uh, refugees and enabling decent um, um, opportunities for them. So it was really, valuable to hear the um, contribution of ILO from, um, from, uh, for the discussion. Um, I th we, can, we can go on and start with the uh, first session. Uh, I wanna give the floor to uh, Barish from World, World Academy for Democracy. Uh, Barish, um, you can have the floor. Uh, thank you, Ashanur. Uh, let me start with a quick introduction of myself and my organization. Uh, my name is Boris Timur. I am reporting specialist at uh, World Academy for Local Government and Democracy. The abbreviation is WALT. Uh, WALT is an association working in partnership with UNHCR, and we are providing legal, uh, social, and psychological support to refugees. And we are doing this through our uh, social protection desk located in 11 municipalities in Istanbul. 
we have a dedicated team with lawyers, interpreters, psychologists, and the team leaders. And indeed, it's a project with a long background. I mean, 221 is the fifth year of our project, and until today, uh, we provided uh, services to more than 200,000 refugees. We provided more than 1,000 1, training for municipal staff. We organized uh, more than 200 mentorship activities, and we conducted more than 100 uh, social cohesion programs. Of course, there is so much to talk about the organization, but if you want to have some further information, you can visit the WAD website. So uh, after this quick introduction, I would like to present you some insight for the session, actually. Uh, today, we will be talking about the migrant and refugee access to the labor market. And while we are doing this, we will specifically focus on the risk of exploitation. Uh, it's estimated that there are about 300 million migrant workers around the world. And among these, the, around 70% of the migrant workers are at their working age, between 20 and 65, 64. So together with the refugees, the number is getting higher, actually. As the number getting higher, of course, the possibility of exploitation getting higher at the same time. So in this picture, the equal treatment, the equal opportunities for migrants and refugees are crucial uh, for this. So we derived from that fact and we frame our session on the topics uh, the following. We will discuss today the right-based approach to labor migration and we will listen to the problems that refugees and migrants encounter uh, in the fair and ethical recruitment. We will talk about the decent work conditions for refugees and the migrant workers also, and we will focus on the possible actions uh, that local, regional, and international actors can take to prevent the exploitation. Uh, today, we will have three speakers, uh, Professor Dr. Fulya Memisholu from Middles Technical University, uh, Mr. Gustav Muzaffari, the Secretary General of Asian Mayors Forum, and Ms. Susanna Klink, representing the UNFCR Regional Bureau for Europe. So each speaker will approximately have 15 minutes, and uh, if we have still time at the end, we can address the questions from audience. So I wish all speakers a fruitful session in advance. Uh, so let me, let me start with the first uh, speaker, Professor Dr. Uh, Fulia Memisholu. Uh, Professor, you are closely working with local governments, actually. I mean, uh, the migration management, of course, requires a multi-level approach, but I believe that the most important actors are the local governments because they are the one uh, working in the field and they are the one uh, practically implementing the pro uh, policies, the strategies. So from that perspective, I would like to first ask you the roles that local governments can play to address the problems that refugees and migrants encounter to, act, uh, to access the labor force. And also I would like to ask you to uh, present some good practices, maybe from local level or at the same time international level. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Perspe, for, for the introduction. Um, but unfortunately, I'm not yet a professor. I'm an associate professor. Hopefully, in five years, I'll be one. Um, as you mentioned, my work on um, local integration measures and how local governments are involved in refugee politics go way back to 2016, when I was living in Adana. Uh, which has given me the chance to work with a number of uh, municipalities in the southeast. Then I went to the University of Oxford to conduct a project that compared how local governments um, were involved in the refugee response in Jordan, uh, Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey. So since then I've been involved in various projects, um, recently on RESLOC project, which you might be familiar with. Uh, which helped me to gain further experience with different uh, municipalities uh, across Turkey. So I have a few slides to share and I'll try to keep myself speak with only um, 10 minutes. Uh, can you see it as a full screen? Yes, because there is a problem. All right. So um, we were given a set of questions and um, I chose two of them um, for my presentation. So the first question is, how can local governments play a role for determining circumstances of migrants and refugee workers better? Thus be able to take action for inclusive economic policies. 
And second, what practical examples and good practices have been implemented by local governments to effectively promote ethical recruitment for better protection of migrants? I rather um, interpreted these two questions as how local governments can be helpful in developing um, inclusive economic policy. So that's what I'm going to focus on. But um, as an academic, I'd like to um, first uh, perhaps readdress why employment is important because it's key to social integration. An article we often use in, uh, in social integration research by Adrian Strang has developed this framework where, as you can see, employment is one of the markers and means um, in terms of um, achieving a successful integration process. Um, although we tend to um, analyze social integration as a two-way process where both the host community and the refugees have certain responsibilities and obligations, um, in the employment realm, it's uh, mainly the host state which needs to enable a, uh, the right to legally work for refugees. Um, and since um, almost 60% of refugees at the moment live in urban areas, this, this puts local governments into spotlight because um, as in all these spheres, local government, governments are increasingly engaged in uh, supporting and promoting social integration. And um, we need to ask how they can also perhaps um, improve the employability of refugees and migrants living in, in, in their districts. Um, so this brings me to my second point. Um, I'm a political scientist, so I regard refugee policies from a political view, and I can say that they're actually local politics because most of the social integration work actually takes place at the local level. And municipalities are particularly important because they're flexible actors, they can operate quickly, they have access to their residents. So all these um, aspects, all these potentials of municipalities put them quite important in this multi-level governance structure. Um, municipalities have the potential to increase resources and capacity at the local level, um, and this is mainly done through partnerships they establish with national level authorities, uh, NGOs and international actors, which I will elaborate in a bit. Um, but most importantly, they can promote the diversity advantage, which is uh, discussed in many studies, arguing that diversity in fact brings um, economic prosperity to a district if it is used in the advantage of groups uh, that could other be um, discriminated. So we can talk about some innovative and inclusive economic policies that the municipalities can easily um, enable, uh, mainly because themselves are economic actors and they can use their purchasing power to achieve inclusive economic policies. And most importantly, uh, they can have access to transnational networks. So here's a diagram uh, we have developed uh, recently in an article, uh, how local governments matter. Um, we distinguish between the role of mayors and municipal authorities, but let's just take it as a whole. And basically what happens is that um, Hello? We can hear you. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, so basically, we analyze the influence of mayors and other, uh, other municipal authorities separately. And to briefly highlight uh, two set of factors shape refugee policy outcomes, uh, which we can generally classify as economic and cultural factors. So the first is the economy. And the key question here, whether the presence of refugee and migrants are perceived as a cost or benefit for the municipal, municipal economy. So it, it very much matters if the municipality in fact consider um, migrants and refugees living in, in their district as an opportunity or whether they see them as a burden. And together with some cultural factors, this pretty much explains why some municipalities remain distant while some others proactively support inclusive economic policies for refugees. And from Turkey, we have many examples of uh, municipalities that rather remain distant, whereas some like Gaziantep Metropolitan Municipality, which is also leading this initiative, has been quite at the forefront of the refugee response at the local level. And in addition to these structural factors, which can sometimes be 
training, there is a transnational networks factor that can help municipalities to support um, economic integration of refugees. When uh, these local act actors cultivate direct connection to international actors, um, they build direct relations with the UN agencies, such as ILO, IOM, international donors, and they receive access to funding lines and become exposed to global platforms and narratives. So um, it mainly depends on the municipality's approach if they want to pursue this active agenda or not. But uh, in my presentation, I assume they want to. So how local governments can shape policy outcomes for better, I'm so sorry. Um, well, first of all, access to transnational networks to attract additional resources uh, to support economic integration. But this is also a two-way process because international actors also need to um, basically be in touch with um, lay, be in touch with local actors. The downside of making presentations at home. I'm really sorry. I think we're all used to that now with COVID-19. <laughs> Fortunately, I have my nephew to help me out, so I'm continuing. Um, so access to transnational networks in, in that sense is important because they help municipalities to attract additional resources to support economic integration. But as I was just mentioning, this needs to be a two-way process because international actors also need to engage with uh, local actors and not just only some prominent local actors, but instead uh, develop an equal approach. Um, in that respect, um, to shape uh, these policy outcomes for uh, better, which will also help me to address the second uh, question of my presentation, what kind of uh, good practices exist? Well, many municipalities at the moment uh, adopt supplementary policies and practices at the municipal level that link social integration and employment. Um, and many of these good practices demonstrate um, that if um, helping refugees to enhance their human capital by helping them through skills development, vocational tr uh, training, helping them to find jobs uh, through recruitment offices, for instance, help this process. Um, but there's also one dimension which I think another presenter will elaborate further. Municipalities can also develop policies and practices uh, in support of refugee migrant entrepreneurship. Um, they can very uh, certainly increase the number of um, small and medium-sized enterprises opened in, in their districts. There is a recent project conducted by the Council of Europe, DELI. It, uh, it was conducted in, in 13, I think, different European cities, which has, um, which has come to the conclusion that that kind of diversity, in fact, creates uh, and fosters social integration. Um, a recent model, uh, which is um, now getting more popular, especially in Turkey, is empowering refugees and migrant communities through the establishment of uh, municipality-supported cooperatives. Um, there is one example in Gaziantep, one in Adana, uh, perhaps you can inform me if you know any others. Um, these cooperatives, some of them are specifically focused on the gender dimension and empowering women. Um, they give a collective sense of protecting um, labor rights together with the members of those community. They help um, the, the members of the cooperative to um, engage and um, integrate into the labor market by directly being involved in the production process. Um, and I guess my second point will be even more relevant um, in terms of how the ethical uh, recruitment of um, migrants and refugees could be supported by, um, by municipalities. Um, it's an area I work mainly in relation to human trafficking, but um, raising awareness in preventing forced labor exploitation and promoting good practices, especially in relation to sustainable um, development goal 8.7 is, is quite important. Um, I, I know some international examples in, in, in that respect, but um, as far as I'm concerned, I don't have any good practices, practices from Turkey, um, where a municipality specifically focuses on this agenda and on raising awareness about forced, forced labor exploitation. Um, 
Well, although uh, forced labor mainly exists in informal or unregulated parts of the labor market, where majority of migrants and refugees uh, actually find jobs, but it can also affect mainstream businesses through supply chains. And these kind of challenges include violation of basic health and safety standards, getting paid below the minimum wage, or not getting paid all child labor, violation of other labor rights. These are uh, often the problems we hear from migrants and refugees uh, when we conduct field work. So what can municipalities do about this? Um, first of all, it's, it's raising awareness, as I mentioned. Uh, but one thing that came to my mind is that um, municipalities can also lead some multi-stakeholder initiatives for adopting codes of conduct on social responsibility and prohibition of forced labor, child labor. Um, as I already mentioned, municipalities themselves are economic actors. So uh, uh, they, they conduct projects where many different um, private sector actors bid in, in these kind of uh, processes. So perhaps um, municipalities can, in fact, uh, help to create these kind of principles, especially in relation to the partners they work with. Um, there are certain initiatives uh, that are mainly led by private sector or civil society, uh, civil society organizations. A very famous example is the Ethical Trading Initiative in the UK. Um, there is the Fair Labor Association in the US. Um, again, I would be grateful if you know any municipality examples where such a co code of conduct has been created, but as far as I'm aware, um, there are no examples. Um, I was thinking about the construction sector, for example, where municipalities are especially uh, active and creating such a code of conduct would be uh, particularly important. Um, some other ways municipalities can help uh, eliminating forced labor is obviously um, they can increase the efficiency of local inspection in labor intensive sectors that could be vulnerable to forced labor practices. These are already happening, but sometimes um, th there needs to be more innovative methods to address this issue. Um, also, municipalities prove to be useful mediators um, between employers and employees. Um, for example, some municipalities in Turkey provide technical assistance to employers uh, who'd like to hire uh, migrant and refugees, but they're not very much aware of the procedures. So they provide them technical assistance or help them to regularize the status of um, uh, unregistered uh, refugees and migrants. Um, it was last year when I was conducting research in Bursa uh, Kızılay and Bursa Metropolitan Municipality was undertaking this initiative and they were regularizing um, unregistered workplaces uh, run by Syrian um, Syrians. And this project was funded by the, uh, the government of Japan. So it was also a very significant example of a multi-level governance uh, work in that respect. Um, finally, this is a list um, of some good practices that promote inclusive economic policies. I try to stick with municipal examples. Um, I've been working on, on identifying good practices for a while now, um, especially for Europe, because uh, there are valuable tools uh, facilitating this. Unfortunately, um, for other countries, this is relatively less easy. Um, in Turkey, there's the UNHCR, um, uh, that the database, but um, anyway, uh, I would highly recommend, for example, European Commission's European website on integration. It helps to identify what kind of good practices exist in labor market integration. Um, I guess I won't have time to go through all these examples, but I'm happy to share my slides. Um, but what they have common is that, um, for example, this initiative by the municipality of Viana de Castello in Portugal, a municipal initiative for labor market integration is specifically addressing, uh, like the Catalonia one, is specifically addressing irregular uh, migrants with irregular status or migrants who will become irregularized in one year. Um, either the, the municipalities offer them a job or help them to gain certain trainings for one year so that their uh, status can become regularized. 
Um, similarly, and one interesting example was from Stockholm, the right to work. This was particularly focusing on unaccompanied minors and refugee youth uh, who will soon be um, jobless and they will not have um, social protection from the government. So in a way, it was helping them to be trained uh, for the job market and become skillful in, in certain areas. Um, there is an example from uh, Lebanon. I think this report, uh, this was, uh, this was. I, I took it from a report uh, produced by World International. I'm not sure. So some of these good practices are particularly uh, focusing on the gender dimension, um, as the previous speaker also uh, emphasized, because these kind of inequalities in the in the labor market certainly affects uh, women uh, un unequally. Um, so what they have in common is that they empower refugees and migrants uh, through helping them to access decent work. Um, finally, there, um, I have mentioned this example, but uh, let me rephrase the, the cooperatives, I think is a very good initiative in that sense. Um, because, for example, in Adana Metropolitan Municipality's case, this is done in partnership with international labor organization, where Syrian, Iraqi, Afghan and Iranian uh, women, as well as the Turkish uh, women living in Adana, they, can, um, they are working in this cooperative, uh, working in the, uh, in, in the fields, in agriculture, um, lately, because of COVID-19, they're producing masks uh, um, in collaboration with, with the university in Odana. So in a way, um, th this helps them to, uh, to, to, to empower even in, in, in times of pandemic and um, also uh, particularly important for the gender dimension. Um, in Turkey, many municipalities are already offering uh, integrating refugees and migrants into their um, art and vocational training centers. Um, this exists in many uh, in many cities in, in, in the southeast, but also in Ankara. Um, also, um, as municipalities try to try to institutionalize themselves through establishing special directorates units. Um, some community centers are also working on vocational uh, training, helping migrants to develop certain skills, raising awareness about labor rights. But what is quite missing at the moment is, 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 the, uh, is the part I mentioned uh, earlier in my presentation about um, understanding that forced labor exploitation is, is, is intolerable both legally, politically, and there is in fact uh, need to be much done, especially uh, by municipalities in raising awareness about this. Um, and good practices are important, why? Because it helps municipalities to learn from each other. Um, and I guess it's also, it would be highly advisable um, for, for, re, uh, for changing, um, for exchanging these kind of examples to uh, promote um, even better ones. Um, this is the end of my presentation. I would be happy to answer your questions in the end. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Fulya Memishoğlu provided us a general framework from local government perspective, and she also presented some good practices from local and international level. So I would like to move forward quickly so that we can have a time for this uh, questions and answer at the end. So from the point that uh, Fulya Memishoğlu left, I would like to turn uh, our second speaker, Mr. Gostap Muzaferi, the Secretary General of Asian Mayors Forum. Uh, Asian Mayors Forum is an organization uh, promoting cooperation among agencies and aiming to provide uh, a ground for sustainable development. And Mr. Muzaffari has also long experience at the local level because he also served uh, for many years as president in Tahran municipality. So Mr. Muzaffari, I would like to address a similar question to you, but with a different perspective. I mean, the specific focus on the Asian context. Can you please provide us uh, some insight on what kind of problems that agencies uh, are facing uh, and what, how they are dealing with the problems that they are encountering? The floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, thank you. And do you have uh, my uh, presentation on the screen now? Yes. Yeah. So thank you very much. I'm very glad to be you uh, with uh, you here in the session, and thank you for inviting me and uh, up, uh, preparing the good opportunity to. Asia Mayor's Forum to uh, share in your uh, discussion. As you know, Asia Mayor's Forum is a kind of technical and uh, professional cooperation network among uh, mayors and uh, city leaders and also city pr professionals during the all over all over the continent, Asian continent from east and south part of Asia to middle and central part and uh, also to west part of Asia, including Iran, Turkey, and some uh, Arab uh, countries around Persian Gulf. Uh, we established this uh, network, in fact, to uh, make a kind of cooperation and collaboration between the uh, city managers and local authorities. The, the main idea of the AMF is uh, integration, Asian integration for better life, to have better life and better cities. And we, we also, we try to uh, develop our cooperation, our technical cooperation with all uh, uh, cities and uh, also city leaders and urban authorities around uh, Asia. Also, we have made some uh, technical cooperations uh, and technical ties with the counterpart organization, uh, international organization like UCLG and UCLG MIWA, Metropolis, and uh, the same organization around the world. So uh, in my opinion, uh, all the efforts of international organizations, including AMF and UCLG MIWA is uh, um, is peacemaking, in fact, and uh, preventing uh, the uh, tensions, the wars between the nations, between the governments, and so from this way, I can we uh, I I believe that we can uh, um, assist uh, to uh, reach a good position for for all the people without any war, without any. Uh, tensions and conflicts between the nations and without uh, refugees, in fact. At least uh, to reduce the number of refugees and uh, migrant peoples. So, you, uh, as I said, you have a very good, uh, the, my colleagues in this session had a very good discussions and very good, uh, in fact, the um, good examples of uh, good practices in around the world and around the, our region. So uh, just, uh, but we in AMF is not very perfect in this, in this, in this area. We are, we are a kind of newcomers in this area. And thank you for um, uh, inviting us to share our idea with you. Um, in this session, uh, I focus to learn from you, and uh, but I would like to share just my ideas about the refugee and forcibly displaced person. As you know, by the definition of uh, ILO and UN conventions, any person who owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for any reasons of race, religion, nationality, member of a particular social group or political opinion is outside the country of his nationality and is unable or owing to such fear, is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of the country, is a refugee. So, but uh, there is a, a problem lies in the definition of the refugee. There are no international agreement to protect people who across boundaries for their, for their economic sur survival.
So uh, there is an environmental and economic refugees, people who can no longer gain to secure livelihood in their homelands because of what are primarily environmental or, or economic factors of unusual scope. The source of um, the refugees is, in fact, the natural disasters and human-made disasters like tensions and wars that I mentioned it, and human alterations, alternate alterations to the environment, climate change, pollution, pollution of the environment, and lack of lack of development and opportunities as well. Uh, refugees are people feeling conflict or persecu persecution. They are defined and protected in international law and must not be explained or returned to situations where their life and freedom are at risk. So they are out, uh, the, all the refugees are outside their countries. They are covered by ILO migrant workers conventions. They need to access permit to wage earning employment. And uh, as my colleague said, to decent work, they need to write to freedom of mov movement. As you see in this uh, slide, uh, there is more than 80 million people forcibly displaced all over the world and more than uh, 45.7 million uh refugees and also more than 26.3 million refugees registered in 2020 uh, also a 67 percent of the people uh refugee people originate from just five countries during the these years uh 6.6 million from syria arab republic 3.7 million from venezuela 2.7 million from afghanistan 2.3 million from south sudan and 1 million from myanmar all the more than uh, 390 percent of these uh refugees moved to just five countries uh 3.6 of them moved to turkey 1.8 million to colombia most of them are from venezuela and uh, 1.4 to pakistan that most of them are from afghanistan and also 1.4 to uganda and 1.4 to uh, 1 point one million people refugees to Germany that most of them are from Syria and Iraqi refugees uh, except the this uh, uh, data and information that originated from the ILO and other international organization uh, please uh, let me have a look to all types of migration as you know there is five types of migration that we uh, witnesses around the world some migrants are international that crossing a boundary easier to uh, I, in international situation the it is easy to control the number of the refugees the international re ref ref refugees and um, most of them are regulated and uh, there is a difference in income uh, between the refugees uh, without any consideration about the income. Most of them uh, uh, have to uh, move their homelands and their countries to other countries because of, because of uh, political tensions or wars or, in, or environmental, uh, in fact, uh, crisis. Two uh, to three million per year 
we have witnesses the international refugees around the world. The other type of refugee is national refugees between the people who moves between the states or provinces inside a country. There is no uh, main control upon him and uh, um, most of them have to move because of employment opportunities to reach to employment opportunities to, to get a better education or retirement. And there is also a local uh, migrants uh, within a city region chain, uh, and uh, they, have, they, they would like to change their uh, position to earn more income and uh, to, in fact, to improve lifestyle. For example, uh, we saw that uh, some, we see that some people from sub air from rural areas uh, have to move to big cities and metropolitan areas to uh, reach a better situation and better life uh, inside the countries. And the other types of uh, the migration is, uh, in fact, voluntary migrants. Uh, there is no force on them, and uh, they, uh, there is uh, upon their this, uh, decision, in fact. And they decide to move to other places uh, by their choice. And also involuntary migrants. The outcome of constraint, as I said, there, there is force. And most of them forcibly have to change their uh, situation of life. So uh, also, as I said about the international migration, Immigration is an indicator of economic and other and or social failures of society crossing of a national boundary easier to control. I, I think I said about them. And uh, in this slide, uh, you have a general view of the roots of the refugees uh, around the world. For example, uh, some people from South part of uh, America or Latin America have uh, they go to North America from Latin America, for example, from Venezuela, from Cuba, and other low income countries or less developed countries from South part of uh, America to North part. Also, some people from Africa uh, move their countries to reach to. Uh, uh, more developed countries in Europe, and some people from Middle East uh, uh, prefer to change their situation, or they have to change their situation of their countries and go to uh, Europe or other developed and, uh, in fact, uh, uh, good uh, positions, societies, and countries. And also, as you see, there is a big uh, movement from uh, India and Bangladesh and Pakistan, I mean the south part of Asia, to uh, Arab countries like uh, Saudi Arabia or uh, Emirates or Qatar or some other, in fact, uh, rich countries around the Persian Gulf. And also there is some uh, human movements from the south part of Asia, south east part of Asia to Australia and New Zealand or to also to North America. Uh, uh, so, Mr. Mufredi, sorry for interrupting, but I see that you still have so much slide, but I need to also warn you, we have uh, five minutes around. Okay. Uh, sorry okay. for interrupting. Thank you very much to remind me. I uh, try to summarize my discussion. So uh, in this uh, slide, you see that uh, the, we have uh, all, we, we can have, in fact, two approaches to migration. The first approach is economic approach, I think. Uh, people from uh, surplus labor and low wage labels uh, situation, they decide to have immigrate to uh, labor uh, to uh, more developed countries, but there is a uh, uh, labor shortage or, the, the, or there is high wage and 
the people uh, decide to, in fact, to uh, leave their countries and to go to another rich and uh, uh, developed countries to, um, in fact, to, uh, to have more wage or more income. And some of them, uh, they send uh, uh, their revenues and their capitals that earn to the origin countries. For example, some uh, people from Iran or Iraq or even from Turkey, they move their countries to Europe or North America, and some of them send the yearly uh, some of uh, their uh, revenues to the original countries. And this, I think the, here is a positive effect of uh, your impact of uh, migration in origin countries. And uh, the, the next approach is a behavioral approach to immigration. Uh, uh, the reason in this uh, type or the, uh, for to be a, a migrant is be behavior and social uh, approach uh, because uh, the people decide to uh, change their position and uh, sometimes they need, uh, they have to change their position uh, because of work, because of education and uh, to reach for a better situation. So there is a more challenges uh, that refugee people confronting with them. Uh, all the challenges in uh, several uh, dimensions, several areas. In fact, and finally, results unfair competition for unauthorized, unauthorized and unprotected jobs in the informal economy. This is the situation that the refugees confronting now in all host countries with this situation. There is no uh, good uh, opportunity to compete with native workers, with native, uh, uh, in fact, practitioner in the labor market. And uh, in host countries also, there is no good, in some of host countries, there is some pre-existing structural economic weaknesses, labor market challenge, challenges, operational and procedural challenges, and also administrative challenges that uh, I wrote some of them in detail in my presentation. Uh, but uh, due to uh, the, in fact, the, uh, the emphasis of new urban agenda, then uh, governments and local governments can uh, help the refugees through presenting a better situation to educate them, to, have, to prepare them uh, a equal and uh, fair uh, opportunities to access to labor market and to have decent works and uh, to realization of human rights for all of them, facilitating living uh, and to integrating the refugee people to uh, local communities and local people. This is, I mean, I'm, uh, in my opinion, this is a very, very important factor that local uh, governments and the mayors and city action practitioners can assist the refugees to be a part of local community in, in, in an integrated way. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, the, thank you for uh, being with me. And uh, uh, I think I try to uh, present my ideas and some of the uh, international facts and international, uh, uh, in fact, uh, perceptions about the situation of refugees and forcibly, forcibly displaced people around the world. I hope to, to be useful for all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mzafiri. Uh, Mr. Mzafiri shared with us the Asian context and he also specifically focused on the how, how important to integrate, uh, I mean, how important to ensure that refugees and migrant workers participating the labor force uh, and the importance of that for the social cohesion and social integration. Thank you again. 
And our last speaker uh, will be Susanna Kling. Uh, Ms. Kling is a livelihood and socioeconomic inclusion lead for UNFCR Regional Bureau for Europe. Uh, she, has, she has been working on refugee integration, uh, socioeconomic inclusion of vulnerable groups, and the humanitarian development relations since 2007. Uh, she had different assignments in Americas, Europe, Northern Africa, uh, with UNFCR, IOM, and several developing uh, organizations. Uh, Ms. Kling, can you please elaborate on the topic more with a, uh, more with a COVID perspective? I mean, uh, what is the socioeconomic uh, impact of the COVID-19 situation on the migrants and refugees? And it's, it will be specifically important, especially listening after the local and regional perspective. Uh, can you please elaborate the topic from international perspective also? What, what the international actors can do uh, to, uh, to eliminate, to prevent the exploitation of uh, workers and refugees, migrant workers and refugees? The floor is yours. Many thanks, Mr. Tima. Allow me to add my thanks on behalf of the UNHCR to the GTFM for convening this meeting and for the opportunity to contribute. Let me see. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I had a technical problem. So yeah, I will focus my, my intervention on the disproportionate socioeconomic impact uh, of the COVID-19 situations on refugees and migrants and uh, also on the measures that can be promoted by local governments, by NGOs and the international community to prevent the exploitation and to enhance the access to decent work. For UNHCR, expanding effective access of refugees and other persons of concern to rights and services is not simply a matter of promoting policy, but a reflection of the broad aspirations of the Global Compact on Refugees, which seeks to improve protection and prospects for solutions through more comprehensive and holistic approaches and a whole of society approach. Local governments and NGOs therefore play a key role, especially in or including in socioeconomic inclusion and decent work, what will be the topic of this session. Um, as you are all aware, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought significant damage to the socioeconomic fabric across societies around the world, not to mention the tragic loss of life. It has, however, also demonstrated the value of inclusive approaches in tackling social problems and the progress that can be achieved through joined up policy responses. Uh, I would like to share some of the key challenges um, that refugees and uh, also migrants had during or continue to have during the COVID-19 situation. The first of all is difficulties in accessing services, which uh, includes uh, accommodation, um, housing and uh, also uh, shelter in reception centers, but also uh, financial and in-kind support. And this is mainly due to the lockdown and to changing modalities. That means that services were either not available at all because they were closed, or some services, especially uh, financial assistance, was moved online to different online platforms and uh, refugees often did not have access to these because uh, they did not have an ID, for example, which was uh, necessary in order to, to register and access the platform, or they had difficulties because the, the online platform was only monolingual, only in the language of the, of the country of asylum, and uh, the, the person did not yet have the, the language skills in order to understand how to, to, to access the platform or there were also um, um, digital illiteracy issues. That means that uh, persons did not have uh, enough uh, knowledge on how to use uh, technical devices, um, or they did not have access to, to technical devices and the internet, and thus were not able to, to access um, the platforms, and this way also not access, access the services. There was also an important uh, loss of income, um, mainly um, due to the fact that was also already mentioned a bit by Eloise Rodel, that a high proportion of, um, of refugees um, and also migrants were working in the service sector, which was highly hit by the COVID-19 uh, situation, by the related restrictions. And uh, they also had, uh, many of them had Atypical work contracts or were working in the informal sector. They were often uh, last hired, or if they had their own business, um, they often had to put their business on hold because of the confinement measures. There was also 
a high number of evictions um, and increased homelessness, which is mainly due to the fact that uh, they were not able to, to cover uh, the costs for their rents um, because of the loss of income. I, I commented before, and because of the restricted access to, to accommod accommodation and um, housing services. Um, integration measures were also put on hold, um, and this difficult to um, the, um, the continuation of any integration measures and inclusion measures in the country um, because of the yeah, COVID-19 uh, confinement measures. Many, um, many services had to um, completely close down their, their integration services. Um, sometimes, and at a later moment, um, many were moved online, um, which had some positive impact on the participation of women. Um, because they often were better able to, to combine the integration courses and um, the childcare responsibilities many of them had. But on the other hand, it did not help to, um, to integrate socially. And um, yeah, the advances were not as fast as, um, as in integration um, courses in, in person. There was also an important delay in accessing the asylum procedures. Um, that of course impacted uh, the legal status of refugees and this way also um, the right to work, um, the possibility to obtain a work permit or, and the obtention and renewal of documentation, uh, which again is of course directly linked to, to the possibility to work. Um, there were difficulties in accessing education and uh, also um, training um, and vocational training um, possibilities because services were moving online. And as I said before, um, due to a lack of um, devices, internet access, our um, digital illiteracy, um, it was much more difficult for, for um, refugees to participate. And often, especially in the case of, um, in the case of, um, um, children and youth, they also um, did not have enough space um, to study because often they were in reception centers uh, where they did not have any, any private rooms in order to study. And this also affected their, their learning experience. And um, they are already the first studies that show that they are um, one year behind or even more than before the COVID-19 situation because of these difficulties. Um, refugees and migrants also faced a higher risk of, um, of being affected, uh, infected through COVID-19 because, um, because they um, were often more exposed to the virus because of um, their working conditions, because many um, had uh, jobs where they were not able to, to work online on distance, but they had to um, be present at work um, because of their overall socioeconomic situation. They were not able to, to use the car, but often had to, to use the public transport and were also um, in, many, um, in many activities as frontline workers and this way uh, more exposed to the virus. And of course, also the, the overall situation in uh, reception centers uh, where um, and crowded living conditions in general, also uh, high at the risk of the COVID-19 situation. Besides, uh, people were affected by a lack of psychosocial support and oftentimes isolation because of the COVID-19 measures, which of course is not only uh, an impact by, uh, on refugees, but also on other population groups. Um, if we look at these, um, what can be recommendations in order to more specifically um, avoid exploitation and strengthen the access to decent work? Um, you have seen that the, the, the list of, um, of the socioeconomic impact is much broader than only looking at, uh, at decent work, but everything is somehow, somehow interlinked. So more specifically, um, the first and most important point is to advocate for the right to work and the rights at work. Um, the second point is to identify administrative and practical barriers um, to decent work um, through consultations with refugees, with employers and with service providers um, to um, ensure the establishment of feedback and compliance mechanisms and monitoring tools. Um, but for this, it is very important that these monitoring tools include disaggregated data by the legal status 
in order to really understand what are the specific challenges and barriers um, that are experienced by the different uh, population types. So uh, for example, refugees, um, subsidiary protection holders, um, asylum seekers and stateless persons or also migrants. Um, it is also important to, um, to ensure that refugee, refugees are constantly engaged and in a meaningful manner in, in the development and the implementation in the monitoring and evaluation of programs and services to ensure that there is a two-way communication and that uh, the projects that are being developed really address um, the needs of the refugees and also take into consideration their capacities and their potential. Um, so in order to, to ensure that any project really works, it is fundamental to, to ensure the consistent engagement of refugees through a participatory approach. It is also fundamental to raise the awareness um, and to train the private sector and service providers to enhance refugees' effective enjoyment of rights and to reduce uh, discrimination. Because oftentimes, um, yeah, service providers and also actors from the private sector are just not aware and don't know about the rights um, of refugees and uh, how to ensure that um, these are met. So through raising awareness and to explaining directly how um, practical barriers and administrative barriers can be addressed in order to enhance the access to decent work um, is a strong tool in order to, to tackle this issue. Um, besides, it's also um, relevant to, to continue building the public support for inclusion and to reduce the discrimination. And this should be done through highlighting the benefits of holistic approaches, the access to safety nets, and the potential contributions of refugees in creating diverse and robust societies. Because in this, um, in this manner, it can also be achieved that refugees are seen as a valuable contributor to the local development and uh, an important member of the local of the local society but this needs uh, an active engagement in changing the narrative and their municipalities and also NGOs can play an important role in this regard when we look more specifically on what services can be provided to refugees in order to to strengthen the access to decent work and extra and to avoid exploitation um, there are some of the issues that were also mentioned um, already by, by my colleagues in their previous presentations, but um, I would like just to, to um, um, stress these. So at first, uh, it is important to, to provide adequate, accessible and multilingual information to refugees and migrants on their rights, on the services available and uh, on the grievances mechanisms. And this should be done also through diverse communication channels in order to ensure that the information is really um, arriving. And therefore, it is important, as I said before, that uh, you have a participatory approach and that you are in constant exchange with the refugee communities in order to make sure that the information is uh, arriving and that the information is really being understood so that it is adequate um, to the community and that it responds their the needs for information and that the information is uh, in, in a language that is being understood um, by the refugee community well, or different languages in order to make sure that this is understood. It is also helpful to offer guidance and support to access relevant services. Um, for example, the access to bank accounts because um, bank accounts are unnecessary in order to, to receive a salary. And we have seen in many contexts that although um, refugees in speaking about the European context, uh, refugees do have the right to open a bank account. There are many practical and administrative barriers in this regard, for example, linked to, to the documentation, but also to fees um, by banks because uh, of the money laundering regulations. And this way, having the support of, author of local authorities or NGOs in opening bank accounts and in advocating with the banks to, to open accounts can be very helpful to address this challenge. It's, as I said, there are also quite a few challenges with regards to accessing online platforms. So receiving support in this regard uh, in order for refugees to be able to access these platforms is also relevant. 
and also support to, to decent work opportunities because um, yeah, on the one hand, uh, they need to better understand what are the market opportunities out there um, and how the, the whole process works. But on the other hand, it is also important to work directly with um, the private sector for them to understand uh, that refugees do have the right to work and that they're capable and um, may support uh, the company and this way create a win-win situation. Uh, one additional area is to enable skills assessment, skills recognition and upskilling um, as soon as possible um, upon arrival in order to, to enhance the employment prospects and refugees' contributions to, to the local economy. What we have seen in oftentimes is that this process is quite delayed and this way refugees are not able to, to access decent work, um, but have to either work um, yeah, in the informal market or um, in lower skilled jobs because they are not able to, to use their skills and experiences they have obtained before coming to, to the country of asylum. And if they receive uh, support to, to, uh, that enable the, the use of their skills, of course, their contribution to, to the local economy is, is much higher. So again, we would have a win-win situation for both sides. It's also important to support refugee entrepreneurs to set up and to strengthen their businesses. And in this, um, in this regard, it's important to, to provide information on the overall functioning um, of the economic, uh, of the ecologic market system in the country, but also um, on um, yeah, more, more in detail how, how setting up a business functions, uh, what, are, what are the rules and regulations in this regard, what are the services that are available, and also to support access to, to finance, to financial services, because oftentimes refugees have difficulties in accessing them. And as a last point, um, it would be important to, to facilitate uh, the effective access to, to relevant social protection schemes um, that includes social assistance. So um, financial and in-kind assistance for, for people in order to, to cover their basic needs especially and uh, housing, um, social insurance to make sure that refugees um, have, um, are able to, to access decent work, have access to unemployment um, insurance, to uh, disability benefits, to pension funds, etc. Um, so that they can also contribute to, um, to the country where they live and uh, form part of the social insurance schemes and also to labor market support and uh, mechanisms that uh, strengthen their, their possibilities both for employment as for self-employment. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Clint discussed the topic from Korea perspective and she also uh, present us some recommendations that local, regional, and also international levels can take uh, action. So I would like to thank all speakers. I believe it was a fruitful session, and I specifically believe that it was important to discuss the topic from three different levels, uh, local, regional, and international levels. We do not have so much for questions, but, but I just uh, saw one question about cooperatives. There was a question about the uh, relation between local government and the cooperatives to address the problems that uh, refugees are facing in the labor market. We will not have to. Uh, we will not have so much time to respond on that. But I just want to remind that uh, as well, we are working on a project. Uh, recently, we are starting with the municipality in Istanbul, Turkey. It will be a project uh, specifically with uh, cooperatives. So we will provide the local governments the uh, the the basic insight on the uh, local uh, the basic basic insights for the. Uh, local governments to integrate the uh, refugees in the labor market through the cooperatives. So it will be like a, a common ground for uh, for uh, local women and the refugee women to work on the, I mean, the production of some specific products and uh, to pr present it uh, to the markets that the municipalities are pr providing for the refugees. And uh, I am recommending my colleagues to follow up this process. I will share with the outcomes of the pro program with you uh, after that meeting. So since we don't have so much time, I would like to thank you again for all speakers. 
And I would also well, I would also like to thank you the colleagues that uh, showing great effort to organize that meeting. And I would like to give the floor again for Ashenur. And thank you again. Uh, thank you, Boris. Uh, so, um, unfortunately, we don't have uh, much time left, so uh, we're going to uh, quickly go to the second session. But as for your questions, you can write your questions to the chat box and then uh, maybe our speakers can uh, answer your questions uh, written in the chat box. Um, that will be more time efficient, maybe. So as for the second session, um, it, it is... Um, with the title, Local Partnerships with the Private Sector, Maximizing the Contribution of Migrants uh, to the Local Economies. Um, our moderator is uh, Fuad Osharat Bey from Foreign Affairs uh, Department um, from the Gaziantep Metropolitan Municipality. So I wanna uh, give the floor quickly to Fuad Bey, uh, if you don't mind. Thank you, Aisha. Uh... I will, uh, I think we are running short on time, so I'll directly start uh, with my guests. Uh, but before starting, I'd like to state uh, a, a sentence. Um, we all follow with sorrow and horror the human tragedy committed against civilians in Palestine in recent days. I hope that Israeli's violence and disproportionate power against the Palestinians will come to an end as soon as further civilian casualties occur. Although we deal uh, with the issue economically here, the problem of forced displacement and being a refugee in their own land continued for more than 70 years in Palestine. Thank you. And uh, I would like to um, uh, introduce you to my friend and my first panelist, uh, Mr. Rami Sharak. Uh, Rami is an individual consult consultant. Uh, he was born in Aleppo, Syria in 1974. He received his uh, bachelor's of science degree economical studies from Aleppo University in 1999, diploma in strengthening the business climate in MENA region in 2016, and diploma in advanced studies in civilian uh, peace building programs. From University of Basel 2017, Rami's energetic initiative, entrepreneurial and collaborative, never gives up and is constantly in searching of creative solutions he has strong skills in conceptualizing and implementing feasible strategies while facilitating smooth execution of high profile projects. He is also specialized in Syria entrepreneurship and private sector strategic planning, building coalition and public speaking. Uh, Rami has a presentation, uh, hopefully uh, answered the questions in our minds. Uh, what are uh, Rami? Uh, I will ask you one question. Uh, what are the long-term plans of refugees' uh, own businesses for economic recovery? How will they overcome the, the devastating effect of global pandemic? Okay, Rami, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Fuad Bey, uh, for this opportunity and for inv invitation. Actually, it's. Um, uh, uh, important topic to discuss and meet all our colleagues and friends in one platform today to discuss this uh, topic. Uh, so just, uh, Aisha Hanam, can you share my presentation, please? Yes, so I am sharing start. the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I would like, actually, I will not uh, uh, repeat uh, too much uh, comments, points, uh, the uh, previous colleagues mentioned in their uh, speeches, actually. Uh, so I will focus more about uh, the Syrian uh, refugees and Syrian entrepreneurs, uh, what they are doing, how they are survived, and especially after uh, March 2020, after the pandemic uh, affect our, our social economic uh, life. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so maybe it's good uh, to mention that the Syrian refugees till now, um, the, uh, regarding to the top uh, statistic, they are established more than 13,000 uh, companies in, in Turkey. Um, uh, the, main, uh, the main investment city, um, uh, is in Istanbul, the second city, uh, Marsin, uh, uh, then Bursa, and the fourth city actually is Gaziantep, with more than uh, 2,500 Syrian uh, companies established 
uh, and registered in, in the Chamber of Commerce here in, in Gaziantep. Um, of course, as, as um, uh, all of you know, maybe, maybe the refugees, the most uh, uh, affected by, by the um, uh, COVID-19, um, uh, and uh, and I will uh, mention very few um, uh, challenges, maybe, and um, uh, obstacles they are faced after the pandemic. Uh, the first, the first one, actually, the legal, uh, the legal procedures, and um, and this is uh, regarding to the legal status of the refugees and uh, a lot of colleagues mentioned about the freedom of movement. Before the pandemic, we are talking about the free um, freedom movement between the cities and provinces. And now, um, uh, upon to the new procedures, we are talking about the free movement even inside the same, in the same city. The second uh, challenge is actually faced by the Syrian refugees, um, uh, business uh, people, uh, is the lower demand uh, for, for some goods. Um, uh, because as you know, uh, it's depend to the business sector and a lot of um, uh, businesses are affected directly with the uh, uh, um, uh, much lower demand of, of the goods from, from the customers themselves. And here, uh, it's good to mention that the, uh, the Syrian businesses depend more on, on the Syrian refugees themselves as the customers for their uh, goods. The third challenge is actually um, um, uh, because the Syrians um, uh, in, in Turkey, depending more on, on the export activities, uh, more than 90% of their business activities uh, targeting the export markets around Turkey and especially in, in the Arab, Arab countries. Um, uh, so they, they are facing um, uh, with the closing borders and the stopping uh, export with uh, specific with, with some, some Arab uh, countries as this is affecting uh, the investment directly of, of uh, the Syrian refugees. And um, most important challenges from my point of view actually is um, the digital transformation. Uh, so it's something uh, new for for uh, for the Syrian refugees. Um, it's first time maybe uh, they they should uh, dealing with a lot of uh, digital services, digital solutions, a different way of uh, uh, digital payment uh, gateways, a lot of platforms digital marketing, social media. So I believe this is the most uh, big challenges um, facing by, by the Syrian uh, refugees uh, in terms of, of uh, business. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, if we back look to the statistic and numbers again, um, uh, uh, beginning from, from this year, 2021. Uh, so the Syrians, we can, we can see that uh, the Syrians um, uh, um, uh, refugees established more than uh, 124 companies uh, with, uh, and investing more than um, 60 million uh, Turkish lira in, in the local uh, economy. So, uh, so the numbers, these numbers and statistics guide us that there is some, um, uh, 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 there's some solution uh, became after the pandemic, uh, the COVID-19. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, here we can mention about, about uh, uh, tens or, or hundreds of Syrian companies actually in Turkey, they are um, uh, start using um, uh, the, the new digital uh, solutions. 
um, and and they are offering a lot of services. So we have um, ten uh, of companies that start delivering um, uh, products and goods uh, to the customers um, uh, by using the applications and uh, such as platforms. Um, uh, we have. Um, a very famous application, food application, just to uh, order some foods from the restaurant, and and this is refresh um, the restaurant sectors of the Syrians in 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 the city. Um, some e-commerce uh, e-commerce platforms um, launched after after uh, COVID nineteen, um, uh, and and. The big, the big uh, opportunities actually is uh, hundreds of Syrian companies uh, owned by refugees. Uh, for first time, they are accessing and re registered in in the most famous uh, Turkish e-commerce like uh, Gidi Gidior and Ombir, uh, Hepsi Boradas. So we can see a lot of Syrian companies, Syrian uh, goods actually. Uh, uh, offering in, in, in this platform, they are selling um, uh, online. So this is a, a good practice and good example about how, how Syrian businesses uh, survive and how they are contributing uh, more uh, and try to using uh, the uh, digital services uh, to survive their uh, investment. Next slide, please. So um, uh, here the importance we can we can we can touch the importance of the SMEs um, uh, in general, not only as, um, Syrian SMEs and entrepreneurs actually, uh, and this is um, uh, I believe the importance role of the local government and municipalities. They should uh, play to support this. Uh, sector, business sector, uh, I mean uh, SMEs and uh, uh, entrepreneurs. Um, next slide, please. And here I have to mention also for, for some good practices uh, from, uh, from the Gaziantep municipalities, uh, actually, they are offering um, early beginning of, uh, after the COVID-19 um, uh, attacking our our life, so they are uh, launching and offering a lot of uh, financial support programs, a lot of um, uh, incentives um, for for the SNAF, for the SMEs, uh, encouraging the entrepreneur to access the local markets, and um, uh, so it's a good practices uh, for for the importance of of uh, this group of community. Um, my recommendation here actually um, to keep going all this support program from the local government uh, to support the SMEs um, uh, and, and to maybe suggest some uh, encouragement uh, program for, for entrepreneurs and, and let them, uh, encouraging them to um, uh, keep them launching their business ideas and access to the local markets. And here, um, um, uh, the government, local government, uh, try um, uh, to to offer some some financial uh, support uh, to the new entrepreneur who's willing to access to to the local market with a loan without any interest for two years which is a very good example um, and and the missing missing role of of the municipality or or the local government actually is to spot on the importance of of digital transformation for for the private sector and uh, and for uh, uh, SMEs in in the markets so they should um, mentioned about the new payment methods, um, uh, how to use, let's say, more technology tools, uh, how to use the digital marketing to access to new markets, uh, targeting new customers, 
Um, uh, so uh, this is, uh, in, in general, my, my recommendation, actually. Next slide, please. So I, I believe uh, that the private sector always play, play the good role as, as the partnership, as the um, um, cooperative with the local government, actually. Uh, to to uh, to solve a lot of problems before, and I believe uh, together um, as local government and private sector, um, uh, they can uh, do a lot to to survive from the effects of of this pandemic uh, now nowadays. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. Uh, this is very brief, um, just. Um, from the perspective of the Syrian private sector and what they are doing nowadays. Thank you very much, Rami. Uh, as you know, it's always nice to have you in uh, these meetings and you're adding so much value to the city, Gaziantep, and uh, also your institution, Syrian Economic Forum, is also adding so much value to our city. Thank you very much. Um, my second guest is uh, Ms. Uh, Aza El Hayek. Uh, she is the co-founder of Skill Lab. Uh, Aza is a computer engineer with extensive experience in information management and data analysis uh, in the humanitarian and development sectors. Uh, she works with Skill Lab, which helps people to achieve their professional goals, enhance their dignity, and allow them to be uh, socially and economically active in, the in their communities. Aza is uh, passionate, humanitarian, putting the human experience of the users at the heart of Skill Lab's uh, work and ensuring that the solutions designed by Skill Lab are based on the expressed needs and desired uh, of the users. Aza also uh, has a presentation explaining Skill Lab's approach to uh, challenges that uh, migrant job seekers uh, face to find a job in the market and how the traditional employment services don't address those challenges currently. Okay, Azam, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fouad, for this introduction. And I know that we are running out of the time, so I will get direct to, uh, to, to my slides and presentation. Uh, so let me just share my screen. Yeah, I guess now you can see my screen, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so as uh, we just heard in the introduction, we are Skill Lab. We are a social enterprise based in, uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, our main mission is to help people uh, or to empower marginalized job seekers, including migrants and refugees, to turn their skills into sustainable uh, careers. So I'd like to begin briefly by painting a broad picture of the global labor market. As recently, the global market uh, faced an increasing pressure and the global mega trends are changing economies and shifting the global uh, labor, labor market in general. As we just mentioned, uh, it was mentioned a lot in our previous slide, there is a lot of uh, uh, for new challenges or new trends in the labor markets like um, automation, climate change, and COVID-19. And all of those trends uh, means that demand and supply of skills are constantly shifting fastly. And millions of people globally need help finding ways to connect their skills with viable employment and careers. So now if you are talking about the normal challenge or the challenge that everyone is facing in the labor market, and in addition to that, we have the, migra uh, the, uh, the migrants and refugees, and we can say even migration is one of the trends that uh, affect the labor market, uh, the labor market and uh, make this shift between the uh, skill supply and the skill demand. Also, as I just uh, heard now, and this is in this um, uh, today, one of those uh, presentations that 80 million people were forcibly displaced due to conflict and other factors from their country to other countries. So many of those people, they just in, uh, initially joined the ranks of the unemployed as they adapt to new labor market and the challenge associated with uh, integration as well. So what I wanted to tell here is that migrants and refugees, they 
really face the problems that everyone is facing in the labor market because we have the new reality. And in addition to that, they have their special also challenges that they are uh, uh, facing. And uh, thanks to all the participants before who just uh, highlighted those challenges. So I don't want to just repeat that uh, um, uh, again. Uh, so, yeah. Um, if we are talking about the, the traditional system, we can say, or we can say uh, uh, that the, the traditional systems rely heavily um, uh, on abstractions, degrees, titles, uh, brand names, etc. These are exclusionary to many communities like migrants and refugees who are without access to all of that. They don't have access to those degrees, titles, and the brands because they just moved from country to country. So everything just is the changing from place to place. So people who don't have access to all of that, uh, they are invisible in the labor market and they can't get the same opportunities like other people in, uh, uh, from the same country. So these communities need systems that can capture, validate, promote and connect their skills with opportunities without the abstractions by focusing on what matters, which is skills. So the question becomes, what can we do about this? How can we help to support vulnerable worker and communities and uh, at the margins of the labor market? And if or and, um, if technology itself, which is one of causes of a lot of labor market disruption, actually help to address these challenges and support inclusive labor market practices? Let's see why technology and innovation is important. Simply because it helps migrants to explore two questions. What are my skills and knowledge? Uh, and how my skills relate to potential uh, careers in the new labor market? Job titles used in one country are not used in the host country. Everyone just know that, and maybe most of the people that uh, just moved from place to place really can acknowledge and uh, um, uh, talk about this, that all our job titles that we used to have in our own country, we can't use them um, as a reference of our past experiences in the new uh, country. So there is a need for better, tool, uh, better tools for career and job coaches, tools that use rich candidates' data, preferably entered by the candidates themselves, tools that expert knowledge data combined with artificial intelligence system, and tools that integrate labor market information in the job and career advice. And this brings us to, uh, to our approach to help migrants uh, to answer the questions that I just mentioned before. What are my skills and knowledge that I brought with me from my uh, past experiences and how I can uh, invest on those skills in the new labor market? So what you see now is uh, I know this just look like a complicated system, but this is the underlying technology of our solution. It's a learning model of the global labor market expressed purely in terms of skills, without titles, without degrees or other abstractions. There are 13,480 dots, as you see here, and um, let's say unique dots even, each one of them represent individual skill. And the closer the, the, the dots are, or cluster of, of dots are, uh, the more closely related to each other. I know that this is so complicated, so let's just move to what is easy and user more user-friendly, which is our uh, mobile application. So this technology just allowed us or helped us to, um, to develop uh, a mobile application that helped people to capture and explore their skills that they gain from uh, their past experiences. So as you just see in the application, uh, the users will be allowed uh, or will be able to uh, report their past experiences. And when we are talking about past experiences, we are talking about job experiences, education experiences, and also what we call informal experiences. Because we know there's 
a lot of uh, of migrants and refugees they just moved from country to country before just um, uh, settling down in the country where they are now and they had a lot of uh <clears throat> sorry they have a lot of uh uh, of jobs that we can say informal uh, because they just moved from place to place. So it's so difficult to reflect this in, in a CV because maybe they just worked for one day, for two days, or maybe they don't want even this to be announced in their CV because sometimes they work uh, illegally. Uh, also, we include in this uh, women and uh, even men when they stay at their home for raising children. Uh, we know we are here in the, in, 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 our, in, the, in the new country. We don't have our families to take care or to help us take care of our families. So sometimes uh, the wife or the husband just to stay to, at home to raise family. So our approach here that we want to collect or to help people to report on all the skills that they gained during their life, regardless what is the type of the experience that they gained, uh, the skills from it. So after entering all the um, experiences, the application will start an interview. It will imitate an interview that will motivate the people and encourage them to report on those in their skills. And in this interview, we are doing what we call the skill assessment, uh, where, and where the artificial intelligence start to, to work here. So mainly the application will ask the users, uh, if, if, uh, how often have you used this skill in specific experience? And based on the answer of this question, the line of the questions would be changed. So this interview is highly personalized. Not everyone would have the same um, uh, the, the same interview or the same uh, question. And by keep asking those questions, as a result, the person will be able to um, to, to accept to, to report all the skills that they gained from all their experiences, even in more granular level. And I just hear a comment from uh, one of, uh, of of our users that said that our human minds can uh, can just remember. Uh, all of that numbers of skills that uh, the person would have or would, get, uh, would gain during the past experiences. It's worth mentioning also here that our application um, uh, support 27 um, language. So the person can use this uh, mobile application, use uh, their native language. We have a 27, uh, 27 uh, different language and they can get the results in different language. So they can just do the, the skill assessment in Arabic, for example, and they get the result in English if their career counselor or job codes, they don't understand their native. Uh, language. After doing this skill assessment or as a result of the skill assessment when the application have, has enough information about the person or have, has enough information about the skills and the knowledge that the person have, the application is start doing the career orientation process. So it tells the people what the, uh, where their skills can be uh, used, what are the recommended occupations that they can work in it using the skills, the group of skills or the skill set that they already have. In addition to that, the people uh, can be able to uh, highlight or to identify a career goal, a career pathway that they want to pursue in the new country. And the application will tell them the number of skills that they already have and the skills that they need to learn to pursue a specific career pathway. So here we tell people what exactly they can where exactly they can invest in their skills and also what are the gaps that they need to cover so they can be employable in the new labor market. And the, set, uh, the last thing uh, that our application also provide is documents. Uh, one of those documents for sure is the CV because we know a lot of people, we met a lot of migrants and refugees just came from uh, different countries to also different countries in Europe as an example. And most of them was, uh, they, they have a challenge in uh, producing a CV, especially when it comes to the language. Uh, people, for example, in Netherlands, they, even if they have uh, the, one or two or three uh, courses of language, they will not be able to create a CV in Dutch language. So that's why this application helped them to enter, as I just said, all their information, their native language, and they can get the CV in the uh, language of the host country. 
uh, the second part of our application is what we call a project portal or let's say career counselor portal. In this career counselor portal, our partners from municipalities, public employment service, private employment services, they can have all the information that was collected uh, uh, from the users in the mobile application. So once the clients of uh, public employment service in any municipality, they start using uh, the application, all the information about their skills, knowledge, uh, past experiences will be available for the career counselor so they can provide them uh, by more personalized and customized uh, career uh, service. In addition to that, and this is uh, even more uh, uh, developed for our partners from the international development sector, uh, because they wanted to use this tool even for monitoring and evaluation purposes to see what the skills that people gained uh, during specific period uh, or specific program from apprenticeship or internship or even vocational training and also it helped them to analyze uh, the skills and uh, the pool of talents that uh, an organization have and based on that they can uh, have decision of the interventions that they want to plan. Uh, so uh, I will share this is, uh, this presentation with everyone, maybe just for the sake of time. I can just skip the slides, but this is like a quote from, uh, from our users in different uh, countries and with different approaches, just taking about, talking about their experiences uh, while using the application. And the same thing, this is uh, some quotes from the, um, uh, the career counselors who used uh, our, uh, our tool. And talking about uh, our partners right uh, right now, we are working now with the city of Amsterdam in the public employment service, and we also working with uh, with the city of uh, of Thessaloniki in uh, in Greece. Um, so this is as category of public employment service, and also Prono in the Czech Republic of Czech. Uh, we have partnership with the Spring House, uh, Spring House, a private employment service, also helping um, refugees in Finland to uh, to access uh, the labor market and we have different partnerships with the international development sector like uh, ILO we have uh, projects with them uh, they are using our tool uh, to help refugees also to get access to the labor market in Kenya Lebanon and uh, and Egypt thank you Thank you very much, Raza. Uh, uh, dear Rami, dear Raza, we uh, thank you both for your contribution and interventions to our panel and for your efforts to help refugees find jobs and contribute to local economic development, um, both in your institutions and in the international arena. Saying that goodwill will save the world, and I will hand the word to Aisha. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Um, I want to give the floor to Fatima from UCLG. Uh, she has a quick uh, intervention uh, on the subject. Um, the floor is yours, Fatima. Yeah, thank you very much, Senor, and thank you, colleagues, for uh, staying uh, here until the end. Just wanted to say a very brief uh, word to, to commend the work of, of our colleagues from from UCLG MIWA uh, for, for putting this together and for this very interesting topic. And in this regard, and just to, to connect the dots uh, with um, both what has been shared from uh, local perspectives and, and, and going also up to regional and global trends and from academic to, to technical. Um, I would uh, just uh, like also to, 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 to share with you that um, it will be very relevant and very important to, to connect this work, work to, to other um, processes that we are following together with um, our colleagues from, from the region uh, in, the, in our international uh, partnerships, as was mentioned at the beginning, both at the Global Forum for Migration and Development, but now also um, uh, on the follow-up on the of the global compacts ahead of 2022 and 2023 and in this regard and just on the thematic level um i really wanted to 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 highlight that uh on the one hand uh this partnership with the private sector is also taking 
a very relevant um, a very relevant role in uh, UCLG agenda. We had the, the the chance to to also have our colleagues from from Gaziantep and and, and Fuad more concretely in our uh, Mediterranean city to city migration uh, high level event uh, hosted by Rabat on private sector. And in this regard, what I what I saw through through that uh, event, which we can see here as well, is that not only these partnerships are key to protect migrants and workers' rights, not only those partnerships are key to foster economic development and also to reduce inequalities by uh, fostering economic inclusion, uh, but also uh, they are key for sustainability and, and, and resilience of the, of the territories. And finally, and what I think is more important at, at the advocacy level, is that um, sometimes we are not aware of the extent to which local governments and the private sector, when it comes to migration governance, may, in many cases share the same goals because um, even with uh, civil society as well. But um, sometimes uh, just uh, opening pathways for regularization and uh, to, to protect mig migrants is beneficial both for municipalities as, as it is for the private sector. And of course, we will be happy since we don't have much time to, to provide uh, perhaps some written input on um, local um, initiatives that uh, would be worth taking into account. But I just wanted to, to, to share this and also to, to share that uh, next week we will be having our um, executive bureau at the United States and local governments with participation of many of you. There will be a thematic session on human mobility on the 18th of um, May uh, in the afternoon. Uh, focused on the on the Lampedusa process, uh, the, this proposal by the, the island of Lampedusa to, to, to set up a global call from uh, local uh, regional governments. And I hope to see you all there also to, to share some of the takeaways of this session. And thank you very much. Thank you, Fatima. So I think that's it for today. Uh, maybe Fatima, you can share the link for the event in the chat box. Um, thank you everyone for participating. Uh, thank you to our distinguished speakers. Uh, it was a pleasure to host you all here. Thank you for dedicating your time and energy on the subject. Any work, any effort we can do to create a holistic society that embraces all of its member, uh, members, acknowledging that diversity is what makes us stronger, more beautiful, more tolerant to ourselves first and foremost, and to others is most valuable. Um, as an ending note, our hearts and prayers are with those who are living under impossible circum circumstances in Palestine. I hope we can exist someday on, uh, on an earth where we can call ourselves peaceful. So thank you all for coming and see you again.